value of a brand until we creatively think about everything that we could do tomorrow to protect and to grow that brand. And I think it's ironic that most people think that marketing is more creative than accounting. Uh, my partner is a professor of accounting and so uh, she's always thrilled when I say to her that, uh, you know, in this area, you accountants are actually much, much uh, more sophisticated than us marketers. The accountants talk about what they call the investment opportunity set. In other words, what could this firm do with the intangible assets it has at its disposal? As marketers, we have to, before we can value our brands, we have to systematically identify the investment opportunity set because that's what determines whether we're going to, how much income we're going to get from our brands in the future. And so with our strategy, our strategy cannot be complete until we've looked at all the things that the firm can do to protect what it's got and to go out and to get more. The, there are also some implications for what we measure. And so uh, marketing metrics is a very, very popular subject at the moment. But most marketing metrics are operational. And what I mean by operational is that most marketing metrics are really about turning the dials on the machine. If I advertise by 5% more, will more sausages come out the other end of the machine? Will I get more sales? If I advertise a little bit less, will I actually get just as many sausages and I'll save some money on advertising? So most of our marketing metrics are very, very operational. To look at brand value, we need marketing metrics that are strategic. Uh, what do I mean by strategic marketing metrics? Strategic marketing metrics are the metrics about where do we compete with what products, for what customers, using what channels, and what resources do we need to have that competition? So let me give you an example of one strategic metric. Some firms use these strategic metrics. At 3M, 3M has got an objective that at least 25% of their earnings, of their profits, uh, in three years' time will come from products that don't exist today. So they've got this um, uh, metric, this strategic metric, if you look at the ma Ansoff matrix that I showed you, which says we've got our existing products, we've got our new products, and we want at least 25% of our earnings or profits to come from that column, which is the new product column, as opposed to uh, the existing product column. Because 3M is all about innovation, and 3M wants to think that they're going to go and get their, their money by developing more and more new valuable products. So they've got a, they've got a minimum of 25% of revenue from new products. Procter & Gamble has got a maximum of 30% from new products. In other words, Procter & Gamble says, we want no more than 30% of our earnings in, in, in five years' time to come from new products. Why is that? Because they think with fairy uh, washing up liquid, with Charmin um, toilet paper, uh, toilet tissue, uh, with uh, Crest toothpaste, they've got all these wonderful brand assets. And if they're getting too much from new products, they're actually not exploiting their original brands as well. And so here, one says, I want a, I want a minimum of 25% from new products. The other one says, I want a maximum of 30%. The interesting question is, what's the right answer? And of course, the right answer is basically uh, comes out of this analysis. You should get as much money from new products, new channels, new markets as the opportunity dictates. If you're Google, Google has got so much opportunity to grow in the existing search market. Uh, maybe Google should actually be getting quite a lot of its profits uh, from new markets. If you were Kodak, uh, Kodak Films, uh, 10 years ago, you should have said, look, existing products for existing markets, we're going to die, of course, as Kodak did. Uh, and so Kodak had this imperative that we'd better get 90% of our earnings from new, new products or from new, new markets won't do it, actually. It's got to be new products. Kodak's got this great brand name, and we'd better work out how we can leverage the brand name into new products because our current products are dying. So your strategic metrics come from the analysis. They don't go into the analysis. What sort of strategic metrics should we have? The sort of strategic metrics we might want to think about are, in terms of outcomes, what we achieve, 
We might want to think about time to money. I'm going to launch a new product. How long is it going to be before it's cash flow positive? Uh, they might be things like revenue persistence. I've got these great products in these great markets. Uh, how much earnings will I be getting from each of them in the next one, two, three years relevant to today? What percentage of revenue do I want from new products? What percentage of revenue do I want from new customers? Uh, what percentage of revenue do I want from diversification? There are lots of outcome variables that you should be measuring to work out where you want your business strategically to be tomorrow. And that will influence the value of your brands. You might want strategic metrics about efficiency of conversion. So, for example, you might look at your share of voice, which is what percentage of the advertising in the category is yours relative to what percentage of the revenue in the category is yours. Are you getting your fair share of revenue given how much you're advertising? We might want to think about strategic, strategic metrics in terms of balance of the portfolio. Am I covering the markets and customer bases that I want to cover? Uh, do I have too much overlap or cannibalisation? So these strategic metrics, once we work out where do we want to win, in terms of defence, keeping our existing product market revenues, in terms of new products, in terms of new markets, in terms of new channels, and what mix do we want, they come out once we develop what the opportunities are. So if I had to summarise the message that I've been trying to communicate, uh, we have this wonderful asset called brand equity. It's important, it gives us profits tomorrow, uh, it gives us defence tomorrow, uh, but before we can defend it, we have to understand it, what does it mean in the customer's mind, and then we can work out where it can be attacked and the weapon we have to defend it with. Before we can grow it, we have to work out what its potential is in new and existing markets, how big are those markets, and what will our brand do for us in those markets, and what won't our brand do for us in those markets uh, and channels. We know how to do this stuff. We have some very good techniques to do this stuff. And once we've identified all of the strategic options we've got, we can set strategic metrics against which to measure them. I want to close, because I've still got a, a couple of minutes, I want to close by giving you an example which I quite like, which shows about where you can take your brand and where you can't take your brand. There used to be one match uh, manufacturing plant in Australia. The brand was called Redheads. And so here you can see these redhead matches. Uh, they, were made, uh, they were made in Australia and it was very much an Australian iconic product, a very strong Australian brand. Redheads was hit by a triple whammy. Firstly, there was a flood of Asian matches into Australia. Secondly, a lot of people stopped smoking, and so they didn't need uh, as many matches. And thirdly, people started using disposable cigarette lighters as opposed to uh, using matches. So any one of those would have been a disaster, but Redheads had this triple disaster of the imports, people stopping smoking, and the disposable cigarette lighters. And so the CEO of Redheads uh, knew that the strength of this company was it had a lot of trees. It had all these forests, and given they had this strength, they thought, how can we leverage this strength to make more money? So they said, the CEO said, we're trying to hunt out a product that will take up a lot of trees. But until we come across something, there is no point in putting more trees in the ground. So given that their, their strength was their, their, the wood that they had, uh, given people didn't seem to want their matches very much, they thought, well, gosh, we'd better, we'd better try and defend our, 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 uh, the revenue streams we've got, and we certainly won't incur any costs because uh, we can't make money out of these trees. Then they realised the company's biggest strength was not the forest they had. The company's biggest strength was the redhead. The company's biggest strength was the brand. Once they realised their biggest strength was the brand, they stopped making matches. Now all they make is money. Uh, and, and so they started uh, integrating into a whole host of other products. Not only did they now make matches, and all sorts of matches, big matches, small matches, any sort of matches, but they moved into fire lighters as well to start barbecues. They moved into these little gas starters. They moved into disposable cigarette lighters. And now, all made in Sweden, not made in Australia anymore, but now this redhead is making them a huge amount of money because they've realised that the brand actually has got this amazing potential 
because the brand is all about fire, the brand has got this amazing potential not to just to make them a lot of money in matches, but fire lighters, uh, gas lighters, disposable cigarette lighters, barbecued charcoal, etc. They did very, very well. Now, of course, marketers never know when to stop. And so I wrote to them. I wrote to them when they did this. And uh, I said, this is wonderful. Can you send me some examples of your marketing? Well, they sent me enough matches to start four forest fires. Uh, and uh, it was a great example. But did they stop there? No, they didn't. Then, this was so successful, now they decided, ah, we're going to use the redhead and we're going to have dishwashing tablets, we're going to have laundry detergent, we're going to have etc. cetera. Uh, you can imagine how well this went. Uh, they just, and so I, I, went, I wrote to them and I said, this is a really interesting campaign. I use the word interesting rather than good. Uh, this, oops, sorry. This is a really interesting campaign. Can you, can you send me uh, some examples of your marketing? I never heard back from them, and so I went to the supermarket myself and I bought all the products, and of course this was a terrible failure. So when you think about your brands, you've got to think about, and their brand value, you've got to think about where you can take them and where you can't take them. And with respect to the redhead, uh, this redhead is fire. This redhead is dangerous. This redhead you can take anywhere where fire goes, but you can't take her into the kitchen. She's not that kind of girl. Uh, so, uh, on that note, I'd like to thank you very much, uh, and I look forward to questions later. Thank you.